session is being live streamed and so we also want to welcome all the virtual audiences that are joining us. Please feel free to tweet, Facebook, quote, uh, take photos. That's what the organizers have asked me to tell everyone. Uh, the structure of the session is going to be as follows. We're going to show you a few slides. Uh, we will then move on to making some opening remarks about sexuality and pleasure. I will then introduce each speaker and ask a particular question from each speaker. And then we will have about 20 minutes for Q&A. And the people that are joining us virtually might also be able to ask questions. Um, so I will begin with a set of slides, which hopefully will get you into thinking about the politics of pleasure and sexuality. Okay, we can leave that slide up. So uh, what you saw was from Carol Vance, who wrote those words in 1982. Uh, someone who has been very influential to many of our, our work on sexuality and rights. Um, I want to make some opening, five opening points about sexual pleasure and rights, uh, and then move on to the panel. So the first one is, is sexual pleasure easily spoken about? I assume many people would say in general no. It is regarded as maybe an intimate space, a personal, scary to speak about. If at all it is spoken about, it is spoken about by men. You can tell by the number of ads on Viagra, the aphrodisiacs, and how men should get a better erection. The second point I want to make is the language of pleasure is less developed than the language of pain and violence. The women's movement has given us many ways to talk about sexual violence and many strategies to deal with it. That is good, but the focus on violence has taken away from validating sexual pleasure. My third point, pleasure is not easy to measure and quantify, and maybe that's why donors don't want to fund it. It is subjective, it, but it doesn't make it any less real. In other spheres of our life, we often act out on what we imagine. We build a road, we build an aeroplane, we even go to war, based on what we imagine and desire. But sexual desire is curtailed. Why? Has society made rules of how we are to be, when, where, with who, how? I think it's a time to question all this. My fourth point, sexual pleasure has a hierarchy. I'm drawing on Gail Rubin here and her framework on hierarchies. Higher behaviors and lower behaviors. Ones we are intrigued by or disgusted by. But maybe underlying is an intrigue. In the underlying, it, there's a lurking intrigue or disgust that makes us think, are they having more fun? My fifth point, sexual pleasure is more validated in heterosexual relationships than in same-sex relationships. Maybe people are unable to imagine that sex workers, poor people, people with disabilities also enjoy sexual pleasure. Fetishism is sometimes seen as barbaric. s and we never even say those words. So you can see that the landscape of talking about sexual pleasure is not as simple as we think. And what the speakers are going to do here today 
is give us some insights based on work that they do, strategies that they have to deal with this issue. So I'm going to begin with Malika Dutt, who is founder and president of Breakthrough, which is a human rights organization dedicated to making violence against women unacceptable. Breakthrough's mission is to prevent violence against women and girls by transforming the norms and cultures that enable it. So I guess my question to Malika is how, when you have violence against women in a mission statement, would you be able to address pleasure? And where is the space for working on not just preventing the harm, but also moving on towards affirming people's rights and the ability to think about well-being and pleasure. Malika, you have three minutes. Can you all hear me? Can you all hear me now? Okay, cool. So this question of how we, the question of how we engage in our work from a reactive point of view versus a proactive point of view, I think is one that really plagues uh, and challenges our social justice work. And when we come to issues like gender-based violence, which are about often intimate partner violence and the ways in which people in relationship engage with one another, it is true that many of us have spent several decades focusing on the harm and focusing on the violence and uplifting the abuse in an effort to stop the violence or find remedies and accountability post-violence. So even in the, in the frame of gender-based violence, I would say that the prevention approach or the culture change approach or the approach that is about shifting gender norms is something that we're talking about more recently. We have actually built entire structures and systems around battered women's shelters, laws, uh, punitive measures against men in terms of a criminal justice system, and that's where a huge amount of our resources have gone. So where in all of this do we actually talk about pleasure? And pleasure in the context of fun, of joy, of what it is that two or more human beings can come together and explore with one another. At Breakthrough, what we've tried to do is connect making violence against women and girls unacceptable with a part two statement that is about so that all beings can thrive. And the way in which all beings can thrive is not just a negative approach to ending pain and abuse and trauma, but also engaging in relationship and in actions and in activity that enable us to experience pleasure and joy. So that's, Gita, how we've really tried to work with it. Certainly, the thrive part can get a lot more energy into it, and I think that that's a great direction for all of us to be exploring. Thanks, Malika. Okay, we're gonna move on to Nidhi, Nidhi Koyal. She is a gender and disability activist from Mumbai, India, and she's also been working with an organization called Point of View. She co-authored the website, the postcard that we put up, sexualityanddisability.org. So Nidhi, for me, and I guess we've discussed this often, when people with disabilities are struggling in the context of the stigma and in terms of survival, in terms of access, how does pleasure and sexuality play out in, with you? Okay. Um, hello. Audible? Yeah. Yes. Um, so I'm just going to quickly, I have three minutes. <laughs> Gita forgot to tell me that. But um, everyone has three minutes. <laughs> um, I'll just start by a short piece saying there was a there was a film recently uh, made released in India which said Margarita with a straw, which was about a sexuality of a woman with a cerebral palsy. Um, there was a claim by an uh, and an uh, in an article by an actress saying that pleasure and sexuality would be the tenth thing or the last or the hundredth thing that a person with a disability would think about because they have so many things to um, struggle against, survival, against, challenges against, around education, employment, existence, medicine, etc. Uh, my question generally and my struggle generally has been as a disability, sexuality and gender rights activist is um, who decides what's important? 
is the non-disabled world giving a statement saying disability means struggle, disability means medicalizations of body. Uh, are we really looking at a body which is abnormal because that's the language in most of our health discourses, in most of our medical discourses. And in the disability movement where um, the, the person with a disability has moved far beyond a medical model to go and engage with a larger social space, saying that society has an equal responsibility to make the environment accommodative and adaptive, uh, the language of pleasure is very much missing. Because somewhere there is this idea around a normative idea around pleasure and a normative idea around body that we even as activists, as women's rights activists or as health, right, health rights activists carry somewhere in our hearts and minds. For example, um, if you think about pleasure, if I say the word sex and if I put a woman with a quadriplegia here, uh, everybody would start wondering, saying how is she going to really enjoy the whole sexual experience because she cannot feel anything neck downwards. But that's because we really have a set idea that what, what do we mean by sex? What do we mean by the joys of engaging? Um, when we look at some of the challenges, as Geeta said, access. And we just take it a little beyond what we understand by access. What, what generally, largely, the globe world uh, understands by access is like building ramps, uh, making accessible toilets, and <laughs> at the most, giving something out in Braille and period, and the access there gets over. Um, keeping this in mind, we thought, where is the access to information around sexuality and pleasure? Where is the information to around SRHR and disability? And that's where Kriya and Point of View came together, and I worked on this online resource, which you recently saw. Why this access to information is important is, uh, we also conduct disability and sexuality trainings for persons with disabilities, and one of the women stood up in this training and said, you know, doctor, we've one of the doctors was a resource person, and she said, you know, we've heard a lot about intercourse. We've heard a lot about uh, other things that you're saying. But, you know, when our friends talk, we've also heard something called foreplay. What does foreplay mean? Um, and this was very telling for us. The doctor was stumped for a minute and, he, and, and she said, how do I explain this? Because it's not like someone bothers to talk about what would your body react like uh, if you couldn't see, feel, or access certain parts of your body on your own? What would pleasure mean to you if you were being cleaned every day or assisted every day in, in your daily chores like bathing, like toilet issues, etc., by a carer, by an assistant? So what would privacy and pleasure mean to you then? Um, Nidhi, one minute. Yeah, I'll give you an extra minute. Just... <laughs> We'll come back I'm to just, some of it. Yeah, I'm just ending here with saying that we identify pleasure in different ways. And what do we mean by pleasure Are we when we talk about the pleasure of being a mother? Are we th expanding our ideas and saying, okay, uh, a mother with a disability? When we say the pleasure of engaging, engaging with a disability. So I will come back with some mm -hmm. examples, but I think this is where I want to leave about broadening our thoughts and sort of diversifying our work into accommodating disability in it. Great, thanks. thanks. So we're going to move on to Shireen el -Feki. And Shireen uh, ha is a British journalist and author most noted for her book, Sex and the Citadel, Intimate Life in a Changing Arab World. I think your question is right there. Can you tell us a little bit about pleasure and intimacy in the changing Arab world? Uh, probably not in three minutes. <laughs> uh, and I need to point out... A few uh, points in three minutes. Less is more. Absolutely. <laughs> isn't that, isn't that, isn't that yeah. the key to our topic today? Yeah. Um, what I was going to say is really the Arab region today in post-Arab spring, not exactly famous as a pleasure palace. And we have so many problems and so many great, prom great promises and aspirations that were lived out in the heady days of 2011 uh, that have really... Um, uh, taken many, many steps back. And we appear to be very much mired in, uh, in taboo. And this is certainly the sense one has from the public discourse around sexuality. And those of you who follow news from the Arab region may have seen in recent, uh, recent months and actually over the past year, several uh, well-known cases now of a clamping down on uh, freedom of sexual expression. At this moment, uh, an Egyptian writer, Ahmed Nagy, is uh, serving two years in prison uh, for having uh, written a book which contained scenes of a sexual nature. 
and uh, also we have a famous case from last year in Morocco of Nabil Ayush, a famous filmmaker, who also touched on aspects of sexuality in his film, uh, uh, much loved, and uh, has been subject to a court case and has had to leave Morocco. So again, the public face of sexuality, very much one of problematizing, problematizing sex and indeed criminalizing sexual activity. The irony of all this, if one looks back at the long history of, uh, of the Arab region and it also looks back in the history of Islam, we were not always this way. And in fact, a thousand years ago in the Arab region, we were famous for actually being sexed up. And we have about a thousand years of Arabic erotica which talks about all aspects of sexual pleasure not just problems as we try to make sex respectable for public discussion today, but also pleasure, and not just uh, for men, but also uh, for women. And I can tell you that there is nothing in the joy of sex, or cosmopolitan, or dare I say it, 50 shades of grey, that they weren't actually writing about a thousand years ago in Baghdad. In fact, we have a famous book called Joami al the Encyclopedia of Pleasure. Um, so we have now had a long process of closing down around sexuality and it would seem again from the public face of it that uh, it's very much uh, clamped down. But beneath the surface things are stirring and I'm just going to give you one example because of the, the brevity of the time. Um, anyone who's online right now and, uh, and tweeting, um, if you go to a site called www.lmarabic Dot com. This is a site from uh, Radio, uh, Radio Netherlands Worldwide. It's called Love Matters. It's part of a suite of uh, social media platforms which tackle sexuality and relationships in many cultural contexts. This site is specifically in Arabic. Its actual name is al Hub Thakafa, which means love is culture. And it is possibly the most remarkable we've seen, mar remarkable development we've seen around talking about sex in Arabic for about a thousand years. Okay. And the point of this is to say that they are talking very frankly in a very clear and accessible language about pleasure. And so it is possible to do this. We do have uh, developments on this uh, front but it is going to take us uh, a long time to rediscover the spirit of openness that our for forefathers once embraced. Thanks, Shireen. Okay, we're gonna move on to Priya Nanda, who is the Group Director of Social and Economic Development at the International Center for Research on Women, the Asia Regional Office. Her expertise is in research, measurement, evaluation of women's economic empowerment and access to health services. I know that uh, Priya has done a lot of research with adolescent girls in India, and so the question is around where did pleasure, and you know how did pleasure come up with the research that you've done, but also this question about evaluation and man, you know, evaluating pleasure. Thanks, Geeta. Um, I think a lot of the politics yeah. issues around the politics of pleasure were framed by you in the opening um, uh, of this plenary, so I won't get into that. I, there were three points that I wanted to make. Uh, when we started um, doing the research and developing programs for adolescent girls in India, our intent actually, our intent was very much to kind of challenge the politics or, and the patriarchy and to really enhance understanding of pleasure and body and sexuality. And what we um, confronted very early on is um, in working with adolescent girls, you have to engage with parents, with communities, and um, you really do confront, confront all the boundaries of what is permissible, how, what are the platforms to engage with young girls, what, are, what is permissible in those settings, and, um, and how difficult it is actually to talk about pleasure. And the way we've, uh, and, and also the, idea of uh, in developing programs we were also trying to challenge existing programs which were very much on harm reduction pregnancy prevention and we wanted to really talk about building girls ability to plan to think for themselves to have autonomy over their bodies to seek pleasure and what we encountered very quickly is how difficult and challenging it was and uh, uh, the way we've been talking about is uh, talking about pleasure is 
more in terms of taking pleasure in understanding uh, what's um, how you can take control over yourself, your future, your bodies, and it's very, very gentle. And talking about sex, sexuality with 13, 14 year old girls in the context in which we are working is extremely difficult. So what I wanted to in my three minutes talk about is actually the challenges with all the right understanding and conceptualization when we come into really implementing programs in the ground, how easily and quickly we have to change our positions and compromise all the understanding that we want to challenge all the binaries of good girl, bad girl, good touch, bad touch. And um, so the three things for me in terms of the three P's of pleasure is really understanding the politics of how do you engage with the communities on really talking about pleasure in sex or even outside. Two is how do we really, um, th what are the platforms in which, through which we can really engage with young people to talk about this and it has to perhaps be outside these spaces of working with communities and uh, engaging with parents because there, that's when the compromises begin to happen. And the third is about positions I and mean, I'm talking positions, not sexual positions, but how do you <laughs> position pleasure? <laughs> <laughs> right. How do you really position pleasure? In certain settings, you really can explicitly talk about pleasure. In other settings, you'll have to position it differently. So for me, the conversation should also be about engaging with each other as to how do we really talk about this in different settings differently. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to move on to Arushi Singh. And she's a pleasure and sexual health activist and from the Pleasure Project, but has also worked at IPPF and UNFPA. So I guess my question for Arushi, um, the two questions, maybe the first one is more easily answered. Um, who funds you? Who funds the Pleasure Project? You, you want me to answer that right yes. away? Uh, nobody consistently. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the answer. So I guess the, the follow-on question is, so the Pleasure Project, you know, if you can say two lines about the Pleasure Project. Yeah. And so is it something you do in the evenings? Is it something on the side? And is it something that is an interest? And is it seen that way when you approach donors? Mm. And what are the kind of questions you, are, you, know, you get asked? Uh, it, yeah. OK, thank you. Um, well, uh, even though we don't have any consistent funding yet, <laughs> uh, we have had support from IDS, uh, the Institute of Development Studies in Sussex, who have helped us do a couple of uh, things that I will just talk about in a minute. Uh, and we recently got a prize for passion from DKT International, who has also been a great supporter because they themselves use a pleasure-based approach as well. So, so having said that, no, we don't. Um, I was at a meeting. Um, some last year, I think it was in Washington, and uh, it was about how young people, how do we encourage young people to adopt condoms? Because you know that's um, uh, always a difficult uh, thing, and they always see it as this candy wrapper thing, you know, with sex. And and everyone was interested in the Pleasure Project's approach, and they brought us there, and they're like, oh, but can you imagine putting that to the head of USAID? Oh, that's not going to work. So, so to answer that question about who funds us and who, you know, who's interested in funding these things, it's difficult, it's difficult. Um, in terms of what the Pleasure Project really does and who we are, I just wanted to actually, I want to talk about this sex toy. And uh, it's this great sex toy which um, I got introduced to in 2004 in Bangkok at the AIDS conference. There were some sex workers who were talking about it. And it's great. It's sort of small and convenient. You can carry it in your, in your bag with you. Um, you know, and so it's ready for you to use whenever you're ready to get it on. Uh, you can use it by yourself and, or you can use it with a partner and you can, you know, insert it on your own, sort of, you know, get ready, get ready, get, it, get into the mood. Or your partner can help uh, put it into you and that's, you know, getting into that whole foreplay question about uh, people with vaginas. Um, so, and it's got these two rings 
uh, so there's the inner ring, and then what you do, it's nicely lubricated as well. It's really, you know, it's, it's uh, convenient to, to put in. And then the inner ring, you just sort of hold that and you put it through the vagina and it goes and it goes and sort of, uh, it goes in and it sticks itself to the cervix so it's not going to move anywhere. And then this outer ring, ladies, this is the secret. When he is, you know, when a penis or a dildo is going in to your vagina, this outer ring is pressing against the clitoris. And it is really, yeah, oh. <laughs> I mean, that's it. For me, that's what does it, really. And, you know, and then if it's a penis, you know, that penis, the, the head of the penis can feel, you know, you, it, it goes against the inner ring and you get that little itch on the head of the penis and it's, it's that little tickle. So, so it's really quite popular. And these ladies, you know, and when you're done, you just take it out and no mess and it's all... Um, Great. So, so that's okay. the sex toy um, that we okay. love promoting at the Pleasure Project. And there's an, a no, similar one. No, in, yeah. in the question answer. Yeah. <laughs> so the question is, this is what we do. Okay. Uh, we try and we eroticize safer sex. And, and we try and get the public health world, which is also what a lot of us have been saying. You know, if we're trying to transform society and transform uh, the politics around gender and sexuality, uh, then if we're not addressing pleasure and who receives pleasure and, and, and how, uh, we ourselves are almost, it's like, oh, I know safer sex is good for you, like Brussels sprouts are good for you, but who likes that? But actually safer sex can be pleasurable. Uh, Arushi, and, you're yeah. more than four minutes. So, okay. okay, so finally what I want to say is we have a literature review, there's yeah. evidence that pleasure-based approaches work, which was funded by IDS. We have a global mapping of pleasure, which uh, charts uh, people who use pleasure-based approaches, and we have a session on Thursday where we can talk more about the pleasure yeah. project. Thank you. Great, thanks. So, I, you know, this is the point. We asked the, we should ask the organizers why pleasure got only a one-hour session and not a one-and-a-half-hour session because you can see everyone can carry on. So, we're going to move to Wanja Mwangunu, is a queer African feminist social justice activist and movement builder. So, she's the ED of Uhai and it's a sex worker and LGBT fund for East Africa and I think uh, the question I have and maybe others too is you know given that they fund a lot of projects in the region you know, what kinds of things you know what kind of interesting projects and what kind of views and assumptions underlying pleasure are seen within some of the work that Uhai has been doing. Um, okay. So uh, I'll start by saying, uh, when you said my name just now, it's Wanja Mwongo, and it reminded me of Washan Shea, who said, give your girls difficult names so that people can struggle to pronounce them and not, <laughs> and not forget them. Um, <laughs> so, and, um, but also to say that it's a little unfair to, start, to, to speak after, after um, a conversation on sex toys. Yeah. Even if, uh, even no, 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 that's fine. And then I and I like that um, uh, eroticizing the female condom. That's actually really innovative. But let me speak a little bit about funding LGBTI and sex worker rights and where pleasure comes in. Um, I come from a region in which, and and this is basically across the world, but. I'll speak about the region where I come from, where, which is East Africa. And I come from a region where the rights of gay people, for instance, the rights even of trans people, the rights of sex workers, are actually about clamping down on pleasure. <laughs> it is the, the, the reason why we do not want gay rights is because then they, these gay people will go off and, and they'll have sex with everybody and they will come and hit on us and, and they'll even, how will we stop them from having sex with, with dogs and, or children because they are people of rampant and controlled perversion. Um, Sex workers and, and some of the terms used for sex workers, especially female sex workers, are whore and slut, which are words interchangeable with women of uncontrolled, indiscriminate sexuality. They sleep with whoever and their pleasure cannot be controlled, and therefore we have to clamp them down. And the, the important thing to recognize um, around pleasure is, and why it is so scary 
for patriarchal systems of control to deal with pleasure is because pleasure is one of the key things around self-determination. And the criminality that we face as gay people, as sex workers, even as trans people, um, has to do with a patriarchal system that does not want people to self-determine, period. That's it. It has nothing to do with morality. It has nothing to do with going to heaven. It has nothing to do with population uh, in making sure that more Africans are being born and therefore homosexuals should not be allowed because it's popul um, population control. It, it has to do with the key point that brings us here as, as, as all these people in Women Deliver, which is a recognition that patriarchy controls us all. And, and patriarchy is what we are all fighting. And, they, and so what Uhai supports and what Uhai funds is the rights of people to self-determine, the rights of people to be sexual beings, to be people who... Um, express their gender in the way they want to express it, and the people who can actually say, for me, transactional sex is a career, it is a livelihood, and I shall do it within dignity and respect. The same way that a lesbian can stand up and say, this is the way I want to live my life. Whether or not I am sexually active, I have a particular sexual identity that needs to be respected too. And so, w one of the, the most interesting um, grants that we made that I found one that spoke to me personally, because I wished that such work were happening when I was a child, was um, a, a grant we made to this women's rights organization in a place called Kisumu that were working with schools, because they recognize that when girls are expelled, when children are expelled from schools for being gay or being lesbian, it traumatizes every child in that school. It is not a way in which people should live, and therefore they wanted to have sexuality conversation with children in school that was safe, that talked about pleasure, that talked about what works for you, what is not right. Also a recognition that for a lot of children, their first encounter with sex is neither consensual completely, and most of the time it is not informed. And so that's part of the work that we aim to support around self-determination and self-expression. Right. Okay, so we're going to move on to... A Q and A. We'll give. They will come back to all these speakers again, and but you can also give them a hand now. <laughs> but there were there were two people in the audience that I wish could have also been on the stage with us. So maybe Doughty can say something about pleasure, and you know we want to. She's been on another session where we were talking about how little people are speaking about pleasure in the entire conference, and. Um, I don't know if Ravi is in the room, but he was somebody who was working on a project with men and boys, and he wanted to say something about his the project that they're working on. But anyway, why don't you go first, Dolly? And then we're going to open it up for questions, yeah? What's the time? I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Oh, come here. Better. Um, thanks, Gita. One of the one of the very difficult and uncomfortable conversations that I have had to encounter uh, in over the last two years, as the sex workers movement globally is is champ uh, championing uh, this campaign around decriminalization, is a lot of uh, a lot of uh, right wing feminists approaches and ask the question is, why would you choose to just have sex with different weird weirdos and you know and all that kind of stuff? And for me that, that question takes me actually back into when I'm when I am doing the sex work. And most of the time there's a, I like how the power dynamic shifts at that particular point because that is the time that I am in power. That's the time when I decide, oh, I want to have sex with you. And guess what? The pleasure part of it is that I get paid. <laughs> and that's awesome. So, so and you know, it, it, it sits very uncomfortably with, with women who, uh, who oppose uh, sex work 
who oppose prostitution. Uh, and Wanda, I do like, it should actually be called whorephobia instead of sex worker phobia because I claim, I reclaim the word whore. You can call me a whore and, and, and I find pleasure in being a whore and I make money out of being a whore. So okay. you ask yourself, <laughs> yes. where is the pleasure in engaging in sex that, uh, you know, half of the time you're not well lubricated or even wet enough to actually enjoy the sex that you're having with an intimate partner who's having sex with you when you don't feel like having sex. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so we, it, it's two o'clock, we still have half an hour, so we'll do about 15 minutes of questions and then each one will have a minute or two each to say anything in reaction to the questions. So questions, comments, where are the mics? There? Okay, there are mics on the side, so just line up and, you know, go ahead. Yeah, there's someone that's... So we'll just go one, one. Just introduce yourself. And okay. I'm Michelle Ernsting, and I'm the head of the Love Matters Project. And uh, yeah. I, I just wanted to say, Gita, you said we, haven't, we aren't able to quantify pleasure, and maybe that's a problem. And I agree. We need to start thinking about how to do that. And we've been spending a lot of time on this on the Love Matters Project, and we now have about 150 million page views across all of our platforms in five languages. Um, so what we're trying to do is quantify how many people are coming in on pleasure pages. And we're finding overwhelmingly that people's first visit is to a pleasure page. And then they come back and they start looking at a whole range of information uh, that they need to have safe and satisfying sex. So it's a way of quantifying. And I guess my question to the panel is, Let's use our, you know, if we're thinking really creatively, I think there's a whole bunch of ways we can actually quantify pleasure or the effectiveness of pleasure in helping people make great decisions about their sex lives. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, in uh, reference to the comment about, ooh, about feminists who are anti-sex work. I'm wondering some of the tactics or tools that you use uh, to sort of combat this feminist and very often a white feminist perspective that is against sex work and centers sex workers' voices. So what are the, some of the tools that you use to combat that argument? Hi, thanks so much for... Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> My name is Catherine Cooper, and um, I wrote a sex and relationship advice column for Playboy for two years. And so I was fielding a lot of questions about pleasure, as you might imagine. And it seemed to me after that time that probably we are in a global crisis of pleasure. Um, but I also wondered, after that experience, if perhaps we were also having a crisis of intimacy. And I was wondering if you could perhaps speak to your own definitions of intimacy and how that does or does, does not relate to um, your definitions of pleasure. Hi, um, I'm Sophia. I'm a high school student from the United States. And I was wondering if the panel could perhaps speak to the influence of like pornography um, on the patriarchal mindset surrounding female pleasure um, or anything else in the topic. Thank you. Hi, um, sorry I'm short. Uh, I'm Megan Dunbar with Pangea Global AIDS um, and I'm, I'm actually thinking a lot about pleasure in the, the kind of, oh thanks, um, as, a, as something we can really leverage in terms of this newfound thing that we have called PrEP that can help protect people from HIV, but maybe we need to be utilizing some of these more eroticizing of prevention to be able to kind of get PrEP taken up, especially among young women and girls, which is a huge push right now, especially among PEPFAR and others. So I was just wondering if, if you could speak to that. Thanks. Hi, my name is Faith Mwangipal, and I'm working with the Gao Generation. We are adding FGM, female genital mutilation, through social change communication. And I struggled with the conversation because I'm thinking about the women who have undergone FGM. And I think really pleasure, sometimes, not all of them, sometimes pleasure is really way 
beyond what they can achieve because of how they have been mutilated or circumcised, if you choose that word. And I'm just wondering whether any of the panelists have some of the experience in that and how they relate in pleasure with such women. Thank you. Hi, I have questions from our virtual community, the people following along on live stream. The first one is, why can't we reach the goal of promoting safe sex pleasure in our countries, especially with young people? And the second is, talking sexual pleasure, a lot of Nigerian women are living in relationships where they are denied access to this pleasure. There is this culture of silence and no one is opening up what they go through. How do we get our women to be more open to discussing the issue of sex, particularly in marriage? There are loads of sexless marriages here, I want to help. Um, hello, my name is Fatma Imam. I'm coming from the Egyptian Center of Women for Legal Assistance. I have questions for Shireen about sexuality in the Arab world. Actually, I don't see the word, the Arab world in that bad situation. I'm very happy with what's happening in Indonesia, especially the association of Shams, which is an association of LGBT, and now they got they got registration and they, they're having demonstration in streets, which is really very good. On another hand, in Egypt, when we had the case of Bab al Bahr, where um, a public bathroom for men was, ra was raided by police, and they said that they are homosexual, we man they managed to get um, equated from the case, and they got a lot of public support, and that was really important. So sometimes I feel that we are overwhelmed with the bad things, but also we have to consider and acknowledge the good things we have. So it's very important in order to complete our struggle. Thank you. Okay, we're going to just have the panelists answer and we'll go this way. So Wanja, you'll start. About, we are 2.15, we have to get out of the room at 2.30 because there's another session. So uh, about um, two minutes each, yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to speak, um, I'll actually let the Pleasure Project speak about yeah, PrEP people and can how PrEP questions, can, because uh, yeah. that would be an interesting question, yeah. how PrEP can actually yeah. Yeah. come through a pleasure conversation. But I'll speak about uh, female genital mutilation yeah. and cutting and say that, first of all, female pleasure is not just clitoral. And I speak from experience as a lesbian woman. There are lots of ways of having pleasurable sex. And I think that the, the and, and I, I feel the pain for women who live in communities in which FGM and, and, and FGC actually happens from a place of non-consensual cutting, because it is not just the clitoris that gets cut, it is the entire conversation of female pleasure, that, that the experience of sex is procreative and not pleasurable. And I think that I would love to have a, a wider conversation on, on how sex can actually be pleasurable without a clit or without the outside clit because the clitoris is a lot longer than, than what we see on the outside. But it comes more from unlearning as women the guilt and the shame that we have always associated with sexual pleasure, from the first time your mother caught you masturbating, to, the, to all the rhetoric we hear about the place of sex in our lives, there's so much unlearning we need to do that goes beyond the absence of a clip. this point because it resonates with so many of the questions and we haven't really talked much about men and 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 the fear men's fear of women's, women's uh, pleasure, pleasure yeah. which is key to yeah. what you discussed about yeah. the patriarchy yeah. and its fear of pleasure yeah. Yeah. and why do we why do men have this fear i mean it's very interesting if one looks in an islamic context women are conceived of as being as incredibly powerful sexual beings and if you don't control their sexuality then all hell will break will break loose mm -hmm. Uh, and so it also comes back to the point of the, um, uh, the individual who wrote in from Nigeria, I, I, I think, or at least commenting on, on Nigeria, um, the difficulty of women expressing their sexual desire. Uh, again, I'm speaking from an Arab context, the problem is not so much that women aren't talking about sex. Women talk to women about sex all the time in private. And men, of course, are speaking to men. The difficulty comes in how do we find a means by which men and women can communicate openly about pleasure, but also the point about intimacy. And I think that's absolutely key because we're talking about a closeness and a sharing which goes beyond the bedroom, which goes to outside the bedroom uh, as well. 
And again, that's a very hard conversation to start in cultures where women feel highly inhibited about talking about sex because somehow they'll be seen as bad women and having had experience. But again, I come back to social media, and again, the, the question from Egypt. Absolutely, there's, there's, there are very important movements happening on the ground to break through taboos and address aspects of pleasure offline, but some of the most interesting developments are online. And I come back to Love Matters, because again, this is a place where men and women are starting to talk about aspects of pleasure, and more importantly, about intimacy, which is absolutely key as well. I, um, I think I wanted to address the issue of quantifying sexual pleasure. I wonder whether we really want to go there, whether we should be talking about measurement of pleasure. Um, I think a lot of, uh, you know, we, a lot of this work of quantification has come from demography and public health, and it very much plays into the harm reduction approach. Um, whether quantifying or having, I mean, we can create a pleasure index, but what is really the value of something like that? Is it really going to enhance our programs? I think there's much more thought that needs to be done in terms of uh, how are we going to have these conversations? I'm taking really good ideas from this panel because we are actually talking about pleasure with young girls, but we haven't broached the idea of really bringing it uh, with the issues of sexuality because of our own fears for the safety of our programs and for the sustainability of our programs. And this is, a lot of this is donor motivated, you know, that your program should be at scale, they should be sustainable. So we are creating very bounded, bounded and censored programs. So I think before we get into quantification of pleasure, we really need to be much more introspective about how we're going to really talk about these issues in the work we do with adolescent girls in settings where there's a lot of presumption around uh, sexuality and virginity and um, shame and honor related to sexual activity for young girls. Thank you. I <clears throat> actually agree with Priya about do we really want to quantify pleasure because we just discussed that actually pleasure you know means so many different things and as many human beings as, as there are and as much imagination as you have as much pleasure can be had from different parts of the body and items and um, all of that. So, but in terms of the pleasure project, what we think about measurement is really measuring, doing a, like a pleasure audit of programs. You know, how pleasure positive, how sex positive and pleasure based are programs. What kind of language are you using to tell people about whether it's safer sex, whether it's public health, whether it's prep or young girls who have been married but are coming in for ANC services and don't really uh, ever have a hope in hell of having pleasurable sex, probably. Um, so so that, that would be a measurement to put into place. And, and the thing around starting conversations, we have a, also a training toolkit that's available freely on our website for you to download and use. And we would really like to measure the impact of that because we've used it. Um, and as uh, Gita asked, you know, what do we, who, who's doing the pleasure project? Uh, as a consultant, I work on sexual and reproductive health programs and I try and incorporate our own um, trainings uh, in that. So, so, the, so that's um, something. And then uh, about porn, we've also worked with porn filmmakers to include condoms in, in porn films in a sexy way. So we try and bridge the public health world and, and, the, and the sexy world uh, in a sense as well. Uh, and I think eventually, if we talk about pleasure and public health and women's health, it's really about enabling agency. It's about enabling agency, it's about smashing patriarchy, you know, ensuring that it's not just certain people who get pleasure, but that it's, I mean, it's the one free thing. You know, you may not have employment or jobs or whatever, but this is one thing that you can give yourself. Come on, I mean. <laughs> Again, so I'm after Arushi, but so. Um, one thing I would like to take off from where she said that uh, it's for everyone and that's what, but our definitions of everyone need to, needs to be clear in our heads. Um, I just wanted to say um, a, a one or two things saying that when, when we think about disability, particularly in the South Asian context, like for example in India, um, people with disabilities are called divine bodies now, so I'm quite divine at the moment. <laughs> and. Um, or we're, we're very tokenistically called inspirations. Um, and uh, the, the whole idea is either to make us very superhuman or to dehumanize with the whole medical lens. So if we don't 
don't basically, we basically pull the human angle out of a person with a disability and particularly a woman with a disability because of this whole idea about how women's bodies are supposed to be of function or be this mothering, caring, etc, etc. So what we're pulling out is their opportunity to sort of um, be in the whole space of you know, experiencing their own sexuality. Uh, I'll just say one more thing is that, you know, when, when women with disabilities have to think about intimacy, and that's very important, it's very, very internalized. They themselves think that they're asexual as, as society perceives them to be. Um, they know that there are some desires and that's the whole confusion in the head because there is an extreme sort of need, desire, want for a relationship, for intimacy, but there is this strong idea which captures it and says, no, 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 but this is not for you, you're asexual. And that's where somewhere it's suppressed. When relationships and intimacy are spoken with women with disabilities, the idea is that you will never get into a relationship. So why don't you do one thing? We are progressive and that's why you should go ahead and make a career. Get an education and make a career. So at least you make something of your life because you can never experience intimacy. So the whole idea is liberating you from a patriarchal bond uh, by allow, quote unquote allowing you to make a career in conservative families because you're not good for relationships. Um, the second thing is if you ha have to be in a relationship, it needs to be more not from your intimacy, love, uh, pleasure angle. It needs to be because someone needs to take care of you. Um, and that's super, super important. One last thing where someone uh, asked about young people and um, t talking about sex education from them. So when we talk about comprehensive sexuality education, all we need to do uh, as activists is to expand it and to make it accessible for all. And when I say accessible, it would even mean uh, giving like tactile models to a visually impaired person, to understanding alternative sexualities, to understanding alternative means of communications, etc. Um, to, to make it really, really accessible. We need to engage more uh, and to bring out, even when it comes to reproductive health, not to kill our own assumptions, to get rid of, rid of our own ideas around um, disability, intimacy, sexuality, and pleasure. Uh, just to round it off, yeah, just one last line. Uh, one of the activists said that when she went to a gynecologist, um, she was in her 30s and the gynecologist said, oh, we, didn't, we don't need to do all these tests. We don't need to do a mammography for you and other things. Um, and she said, why? Because two of them had gone together and the, uh, the gynec said, oh, because, you know, yeah, I mean, we don't need to do it for you. And there was this awkward pause. And uh, the idea was to do it for sexually active uh, women. And this was a progressive gynecologist. So both the women were single, unmarried, Sorry, unmarried, but one was tested, one was not, because the assumption was that the disabled person would not be sexually active. So that's where we need to broaden our thinking. Thank you. One of the things that we're doing is working on the issue of sexual assault on college campuses in the United States. And so we're deep in this discussion about sexuality, and one of the things that we're doing is working with men in fraternities, because gender norms really are intimately tied to how sexual behavior then gets enacted. And rights of initiation around masculinity in the fraternity space are then constructed around how many pictures of boobs can you get or how, what's the rating system around women who are DTF. DTF stands for down to fuck. So there's a whole host of ways in which cultural norms and gender norms really need to be interrogated if we are going to liberate pleasure into the fullness of its expression and being. And this is where I think for those of us who are working on gender-based violence and looking at harm, have to be really, really careful that we don't just devolve into staying on the harm side even as we are transforming the gender norms that we want to create, to build the world that we want to see. And so building the world that we want to see means not just saying we don't want this, also saying we want that and we want pleasure and we want joy and we want dance and we want a whole bunch of things. Just one other quick thing that I wanna say is that for all of us in this room, you know, we've, we've all gone through this dance of dealing with our own relationship with pleasure and sex and sexuality because all of us are part of these same cultural constructs. I mean, we live in them, we are informed by them. And so the, to the point that was made earlier about 
how we are dealing with the ways in which we ourselves have shame and pain. If one in three women have been sexually abused in our lifetimes, then there's lots of us who've dealt with that. So what are the ways as feminists that we can start to really engage with the shame and the pain and find ways to make our own journeys of healing, make our own journeys of connection with one another, make our own journeys of finding ways to make pleasure and joy and love an integral part of our own lives and how we live. Okay, so I want to also end by giving three additional thoughts to what people have said. One is the rights discourse on pleasure. Because many times when we are working with young people, they say, what about the right to pleasure? And we've tried to shift that to saying, because of the way human rights are understood as um, also very oriented towards the state, you know, uh, being accountable to offering you that right, we've begun to talk about the right to seek pleasure rather than the right to pleasure. The other one is a very interesting project that Tarshi led in India with young people and was about 15 years ago and the, the project was called Pleasure Me Safely. And so they, even though it was an AIDS intervention and a very, you know, they took the word pleasure into it, put it up front and everything uh, was, you know, captured within this idea of Pleasure Me Safely and a lot more young people reacted and participated in that campaign. And I think the last thing, and we will end here and give everyone a hand, is that what we want to be able to do is, res you know, increase respect, increase respect f for pleasure rather than respectability of pleasure. And I think if people can, you know, always seek to increase respect of spe sex workers to have pleasure, and, you know, trans people to have pleasure rather than the respectability of what kind of pleasure I think we would be in a better space in the next Women Deliver conference. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>